Well, hello and welcome. It's good to have you joining us today for our service on video. Uh, we've been able to meet together in our church with limited numbers and we're enjoying uh, being able to do that, but we also recognise that not everyone is able to. So we're continuing on with our video services, uh, for the moment at least, and uh, we're glad that you can join us as we come together to worship our great God. I want to read to you from the book of Revelation and from verse from chapter 21. John writes, Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and there was no longer any sea. I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride, beautifully dressed for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Now the dwelling of God is with men, and he will live with them. They will be his people, and God himself will be with them and be their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain, for the old order of things has passed away. Well, let's come before God in prayer. Let's pray. Lord God, we come to you and we acknowledge that you are the one who is Lord over all. You are the one who has made this world and everything in it, and you are the one who is remaking it. Lord, we look forward to that day when everything will be made new again. My Father, we thank you that you have a purpose and a plan in all that you do. We thank you that we can see here in this revelation the future that you have for your people, a future of eternity gathered together with you, where they are able to dwell with you, where everything that is wrong has been undone and taken away. Every tear is gone, no more death or mourning, no more pain or suffering. Oh, Father, we look forward to that day. We look forward to the time that we can enjoy everything made right in your presence. But Father, as we wait, as we wait for that day to come, we pray strengthen us in our faith. Help us to look to you. Help us to rest in your goodness to us, that even in the midst of the death and mourning and pain that we experience here on this earth, oh Father, we pray, help us to remember your goodness, to remember that you are the God who has everything in hand. We know that you care for us. Our Father, we confess that at times we, we doubt, there are times we wonder why things are happening and what is going on here, and we are tempted to, to think that you are not in control. But Lord, we know that you are. You have assured us over the years that you are the one who is bringing all things together in your Son, our Lord Jesus. So Father, we pray, renew us in our faith and trust. Help us to rest in you and all that you've done for us. This we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, one thing that we can do uh, on our video uh, services is that we can sing. We're not allowed to do that in our physical gatherings yet. But uh, I encourage you to, to join together in singing to God's praise with our first song, O oh, Praise the Name of Jesus. Well, we believe in a risen Saviour. Uh, so we're going to stand and sing uh, in our lounge rooms. Uh, the wonder of the glory of the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ.
Kids talk, and uh, we're continuing on with the quiz work series of talks looking at the book of Acts. And uh, this week they're looking at Acts chapters 13 and 14. So, if the kids want to get up close, they can see better and uh, see what the quiz works have to tell us about the events of those chapters in the life of the early church. <laughs> Hi everyone, I'm Chrissy. And I'm Mendel. Well, today, as we continue looking at the awesome book of Acts, we are going on a journey. I'm going to go and get ready. Remember, Jesus had given his followers a mission. And Jesus' mission is that people from all around the world would hear that Jesus is the king. And Jesus' mission is that people from all around the world would accept Jesus as their king. Well, today, as we look at Acts chapters 13 and 14, we are going to see this mission continue to spread. I'm ready. Mendel, what are you doing? I'm ready for our journey. We're not actually going anywhere. <gasps> We're not? No. I've asked some of my friends to act out the journey that we read about in Acts chapter 13 and 14. Paul lived in this town called Antioch. And Paul was going on a journey. A, no, not a beach holiday. No, not a camping holiday. Uh, no, this was before cars were invented. Sorry, Paul. Paul was going on this journey. Tell people about the risen King Jesus. And so Paul went with the Holy Spirit and with the message of the risen King Jesus. And he set out on his journey. Well, why don't we go on this journey with Paul? Everyone, I want you to stand up and follow Paul. Well, after walking a while, Paul got on a boat and sailed on the Mediterranean Sea. Paul has come to a town. Let's all sit down and see what happens. In a town called Paphos, Paul came across two men. The first man was an important and smart man. And this man wanted to hear about the risen King Jesus. But the second man was a sorcerer. And this man did not want to hear about the risen King Jesus. This man tried to stop others hearing about the risen King Jesus as well. Uh-oh. Maybe this would stop the mission of the risen King Jesus. But Paul had the message and he had the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit gives people the power to keep spreading the message. So the sorcerer was stopped. And Paul went on to tell the first man, Jesus is the risen King. Repent and accept Jesus as your King. And the first man did repent and did accept Jesus as his king. Hooray! And then Paul left. Well, first Paul sailed back across to the mainland. Paul's reached land. Paul walked and he walked 
until he got to another town. Let's all sit back down and see what happens here. In Pisidian Antioch, Paul met a group of people. Paul told people how Jesus had died, but then he came back to life again. He told them, Jesus is the risen King. Repent and accept Jesus as your King. Some people did repent and accept Jesus as their King, but some people did not like what they heard. This group kicked Paul out of town. Uh-oh. Maybe this would stop the mission of the risen King Jesus. But Paul had the message and he had the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit gives people the power to keep spreading the message. Jesus is the risen King. Repent and accept Jesus as your King. Okay, let's stand up and walk with Paul. Paul walked from place to place and he came to a town called Lystra. Let's stop and see what happens here. In Lystra, Paul found a man whose legs didn't work, but with the power of the Holy Spirit, Paul was able to heal the man. A lot of people saw what Paul did and they were amazed. But then they started worshiping Paul instead of God. Oh dear, Paul was not happy about this. He tried to tell them, Jesus is the risen king, not me. Repent and accept Jesus as your king. This made the people mad and they tried to kill Paul instead. And when the crowd thought Paul was dead, they just left him there. Oh no, surely this was the end. Jesus' mission was over. But no, God wanted Paul to keep going on Jesus' mission. And so Paul was able to get up and Paul still had the message and the Holy Spirit. And because the Holy Spirit gives people the power to keep spreading the message, Paul continued on the mission. Well, Paul went back the way he came. Let's see if we can keep up. Finally, Paul arrived back where he started. And in his hometown, Paul told everyone, Jesus is the risen king. Repent and accept Jesus as your king. Because Paul still had the message and the Holy Spirit. And because the Holy Spirit gives people the power to keep spreading the message, Paul could continue on the mission. Did you see my brilliant acting? I sure did. I didn't even know you had legs. Ah, yeah, movie magic. But man, Paul was really serious about telling people about the risen King Jesus. And it wasn't always easy, but Paul knew that everyone needed to hear about the risen King Jesus. And so Paul got busy on Jesus' mission. He sure did, but... Boy, all that acting has worn me out. <laughs> I'm sure it did. I'm going to go and recuperate with some delicious seaweed dipped in sand. Well, today in Acts chapters 13 and 14, we have seen that Paul did take Jesus' mission seriously. He kept telling people about the risen King Jesus, even when it was really hard. And there were lots of times when it looked like Jesus' mission might be stopped. But we know, do it with me, that the mission of the risen King Jesus cannot be stopped. And if you have accepted Jesus as your King, then Jesus wants you to be part of his mission too. You might not travel to all the places that Paul did, but you can be involved in the mission by telling the people you meet, your friends, your family, your neighbours about the risen King Jesus. Because we have the Holy Spirit living in us and we have the message of the risen King Jesus here as well. And to help you, don't forget to check out the activities and the extras at www.quizworks.com forward slash home delivery. See you next time.
Let's all sing to our holy God. God is a holy God. God is a holy God. We can't be friends because of our sin. We can't be friends because of our sin. God is a holy God. God is a holy God. We can't be friends because of our sin. We can't be friends because of our sin. Jesus died to wash us clean When we put our trust in Him God opens His arms and welcomes us in 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 God is a holy God Of our sin, we can't be friends because of our sin. God is a holy God, God is a holy God. We can't be friends because of our sin, we can't be friends because of our sin. Jesus died to wash us clean when we put our trust in Him. God opens His arms and welcomes our sin. God opens opens his arms and welcomes us in. God opens his arms and welcomes us in. We're going to hear from God's word now. And Cole is going to read to us from Revelation chapter 7. And then after that, Angus will speak to us from God's word. Today's reading comes from Revelation chapter 7 verses 9 to 17. After this I looked out there, before me was a great multitude that no one could count, from every nation, tribe, people and language, standing before the throne and in front of the Lamb. They were wearing white robes and were holding palm branches in their hands. And they, they then cried out in a loud voice, Salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. All the angels were standing around the throne and around the elders and the four living creatures. They fell down on their faces before the throne and worshipped God, saying, Amen. Praise and glory and wisdom and thanks and honour and power and strength be to our God forever and ever. Amen. Then one of the elders asked me, These in white robes, who are they and where did they come from? I answered, Sir, you know. And he said, These are are they who have come out of the great tribulation. They have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. Therefore, they are before the throne of God and serve him day and night in his temple. And he who sits on the throne will spread his tent over them. Never again will they hunger, never again will they thirst. The sun will not beat upon them, nor the scorching heat. For the lamb at the centre of the throne will be their shepherd. He will lead them to springs of living water, and God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. Amen. Well, good day. It's great that we can be here uh, together to uh, sit at God's feet and hear him speak to us through his word. Uh, as we begin our time uh, looking at God's word together, I'm going to pray uh, that God would help us. Uh, and so please uh, join me as we pray. Father, we thank you so much for your word. Uh, we thank you that we can sit at your feet now and hear you speak to us. Lord, we pray that as we work through this wonderful part of your, your scriptures, we pray that you would captivate our hearts, uh, that you would grip us with the glory of the risen Lord Jesus and spur us on with hope, uh, knowing that you have given us life. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. 
Well, I wonder what your goal is. What is it that you're running after? If you knew the end game, if you knew how everything was going to wrap up, if you knew the result, how would that change the way that you go about life? Whenever I read a book, I hate flipping to the end and seeing how it's going to finish. Uh, I feel that it just spoils the story. Uh, But it also, I find, it just doesn't make any sense at all. I have no idea who these characters are. I don't know them well enough. I haven't walked this journey with them and see their characters develop over the course of the book. There is no context to those final lines. You know, if you flip to the end of one of my favourite books, The Lord of the Rings, and you read the last line that simply says, and he sat down and said, well, I'm back. You'd have no idea what Sam is referring to there. Where's he been? What has he done? Or perhaps if you flip to the end of one of my other favourite books, The Count of Monte Cristo, and read the final line, My dearest, said Valentine, has not the Count just told us that all human wisdom was contained in these two words, wait and hope? You'd have no idea of the journey that these characters have been on. You have no idea who this Count is. You have no idea about the quest for revenge and justice that is shown throughout the book. When we skip to the end, we just don't appreciate it as much as if we've walked the journey. Well, when it comes to to living for Jesus and to walking this journey of life, skipping to the end is actually really important. It's not going to spoil the ending. It's not going to ruin the surprise. In fact, it's actually going to help you. It's actually going to encourage you as you journey now. Because if we know where our hope is, if we know what our goal is, well, this actually gives us perspective and encouragement in what we go through now. And as we glimpse forward, as we look at Revelation chapter 7, to wrap up our series on the gospel and evangelism, we get a glimpse of what it is that we are moving towards. We get a wonderful glimpse at the beauty and the majesty of God and of being part of this great multitude that is gathered around God's throne, worshipping Him. And as, and as we think about those people that we love, our family, our friends, our colleagues, all those people we know who don't recognise Jesus and Lord, as Lord and Saviour, Knowing what awaits all those who are saved, that wonderful hope that we have, but also knowing what the alternative is, that there is judgment and hell for those who don't trust in Jesus. You know, this glimpse of the future is so important for us. Because this glimpse from the future empowers our mission now. So as we've built each week on various themes and aspects of the gospel and how it applies to us and our world, what is the end game? We began this series looking at 1 Corinthians 15, understanding what the gospel is. We've looked at atonement, how Jesus' death paid the price for our sin. We've looked at the whole idea about reconciliation, that Jesus has brought about reconciliation for us. We've looked at how the gospel is not just about saving individuals from hell and judgment, but it is about God's kingdom that is being brought about through Jesus on on a cosmic level. We've thought about the reality of hell and the promise of eternal life. We've looked at the role of the Holy Spirit as the one who opens the hearts and eyes of those we are sharing the gospel with. We've looked at the role of us and how we take that message of salvation to others. We've stopped and thought about what is the role of the church in evangelism. We've thought about the culture that we live in. What is the world that is around us? And what are the problems with that? And how does Jesus redeem that culture? We've stopped and thought together about how we can understand our culture and how we can apply the gospel to it. We've stopped and listened to people's stories and thought about the power of story in sharing the good news of Jesus. 
So what is all this working towards? Well, it's working towards this. Read with me from Revelation chapter 7 from verse 9. After this I looked, and behold a great multitude that no one could number, from every nation, from all tribes and peoples and languages, standing before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed in white robes with palm branches in their hands, and crying out with a loud voice, Salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. And all the angels were standing around the throne and around the elders and the four living creatures, and they fell on their faces before the throne and worshipped God, saying, Amen. Blessing and glory and wisdom and thanksgiving and honour and power and might be to our God forever and ever. Amen. That is what it is working towards. You know, how often do you lift your heart and think of this beautiful image of God on his throne, surrounded by a multitude of those who are saved? You know, lifting your eyes to that, does, does that do anything in your heart? Does that stir you deep down that that is what you are a part of? You know, this isn't some abstract image of a faceless crowd that we might see at the AFL Grand Final. The MCG packed to the rafters with just a mass of blurred faces as we watch the game. This is a multitude of individuals, each with their own stories. Each have had their own journey. Each of them have come to know Jesus as Lord and Saviour. They're young, they're old, they're from all the four corners of the earth. They are from different ethnic groups, different family groups, different language groups. They are your brothers and sisters in Christ. You know, this is your family and this is you know, the biggest family reunion that there is. Each person there has a story to tell about how Jesus rescued them. They have a story that says, Jesus saved me, Jesus rescued me. I was lost, but now I am found. I was running my own race, running a hellbound race, but Jesus rescued me. Each of these faces has a story to tell of God's grace. And we are part of that multitude. We will one day stand with them dressed in white robes, saying that we have been washed clean. We will be there with those branches in our hands, those palm branches that's, that are a symbol of God's victory that Jesus has won. You know, this is a fulfillment of that promise that God made to Abraham in Genesis 15, chapter 5, where we read that, and God brought Abraham outside and said, look towards the heavens and number the stars if you are able to number them. Then he said to him, so shall your offspring be. And you know, right here in this passage in Revelation, we see God saying, you know, that promise that I made to Abraham, well, here it is. I have been faithful to what I said I would do. I have made a multitude of people who are my children and they are worshipping me because I have made all things new. I have redeemed them. I have rescued them through my son. And what is this multitude doing? Well, every affection, every thought, every breath, every action, every word is a movement of worship towards God saying, salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. This rescue has been an action that God himself has undertaken. Salvation belongs to him. How? Through the Lamb. Through Jesus, the Lamb of God. The Lamb who was sacrificed. His blood was shed so that yours wasn't. That is what rescued you. You didn't deserve that. I didn't deserve that, but God did it to show his glory. You know, John Newton's famous last words that were recorded sum up this so powerfully. He said this, my memory is nearly gone, but I can remember two things, that I am a great sinner and that Christ is a great saviour. You see, salvation belongs to our God who is seated on the throne. 
and to the Lamb. Our sin was so great that we couldn't do that ourselves. We could never save ourselves. But Christ is a great Saviour. And He's your Lord. And His Lordship is over everything. You know, as we live every moment of every day now, we are living under His Lordship. You know, when you're doing the dishes, Jesus is Lord. When you're reading books with your kids at the end of the day, Jesus is Lord. When you're wading through emails, Jesus is Lord. This is a truth that as followers of Jesus, we can declare and hold on to in every moment of every day. That when you're struggling with doubts, you can know that Jesus is Lord and that salvation belongs to our God. That when you're struggling with grief, you can know and hold on to that salvation is ours and it belongs to, salvation belongs to our God. Salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and unto the Lamb. Why? Verse 12, Amen. Blessing and glory and wisdom and thanksgiving and honour and power and might be to our God forever and ever. You see, God will have glory in both the mundane of life and the magnificent. God will receive blessing through those barren moments that we walk through and in those beautiful moments that we enjoy. He is perfect wisdom even when life seems chaotic. He is the one that we say thank you to. Because no matter what you experience, it is part of his purposes. He will use everything for his honour, for his glory, and for his purposes. Why? Because power and might belong to our God. And he is bringing everything to himself. This glimpse that we see here in this passage is a glimpse we see of a forever. And that forever enables us to keep going. This glimpse from the future empowers our mission now. So as you look around the world, as as we see the pain, as we see the foolishness, as we see the inaction, as we see the pursuit of glory and gain at the cost of others. You know, we can know that that is not how this story ends. It doesn't end like that. It ends with this great multitude gathered around the throne of God. But you know what? God is on that throne right now. He is on the throne right now. But this glimpse into the throne room, this glimpse of the end game doesn't finish here because we see the Apostle John go on to describe this multitude in more detail for us and what it's going to be like for all those who live in the light of God's glory. Look with me at these verses from verses 13 to 17. Then one of the elders addressed me saying, who are these clothed in white robes and from where have they come? I said to him, sir, you know. And he said to me, these are the ones coming out of the great tribulation. They've washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the lamb. Therefore, they are before the throne of God and serve him day and night in his temple. And he who sits on the throne will shelter them in his presence. They shall hunger no more neither thirst any more. The sun shall not strike them, nor any scorching heat, for the lamb in the midst of the throne will be their shepherd. He will guide them to springs of living water and God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. You know, John is asked, who are these people? You know, these are the ones that have come out of the great tribulation. What does he mean by this? Is God, I mean, is John applying this to those specifically who have been martyred for their faith? You know, those people who were thrown to the lions in the Colosseum, those people who were burned at the stake, those people who have been massacred, those people who were beheaded on beaches wearing orange jumpsuits, those people that were thrown into prison camps. Is he speaking specifically about martyrs? Or is he speaking about all Christians who have suffered for their faith? That this great tribulation that is spoken of here is actually simply 
the Christian life that we all walk. Where yes, some will be beaten, some will be shot at, some will be thrown in prison, some will die for their faith as martyrs. But John is also speaking about the one who is rejected from their family by having faith. Speaking of the ones who are bullied at school for simply being that Christian kid. Those who are made fun of at work for not joining in. They are all those who have suffered varying amounts of struggles in the trials of this life. Because we all suffer as Christians. We all have trials and struggles that we go through. Whether that's cancer or criticism. Whether that's derision or depression. Whether that's abuse or just the consequence of someone's anger. This great tribulation is is all of us. All of us who simply walk through this life experiencing the suffering that comes, the suffering that is to be expected as we walk the Christian life. But we know from God's word that our suffering isn't meaningless. We know in Romans 8 that our suffering is actually doing something in us. And it will reach its conclusion. And what is this end game? What is the end of all this? Well, John shows us here this passage that all those who suffer as a result of walking the Christian life, they reach their end. They have come out of that. It does end. And they are now clothed in white. They have now finished the race. They have been washed clean. Their sin has been dealt with. They have been saved through the blood of the Lamb. That at the cross, Jesus rescued them. Just like he rescued me. Just like he rescued you at the cross. And we see this stunning description of life that awaits all those who trust God. In Jesus. I'm going to read verses 15 and 17 again, and perhaps you might want to close your eyes as you listen to God's word. It says, Therefore they are before the throne of God and serve him day and night in his temple. And he who sits on the throne will shelter them with his presence. They shall hunger no more, neither thirst any more. The sun shall not strike them, nor any scorching heat. For the lamb in the midst of the throne will be their shepherd. He will guide them to springs of living water. And God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. That's how the story ends. That is what Jesus has won for you. That's what Jesus has won for me. That is what he has to offer you if you have not believed yet. A life in God's forever kingdom. Joining together in God's forever. These passages give us a glimpse of the glory of God and the glory of his new creation. And this image of glory actually drives us in our mission. This glimpse from the future actually empowers us in our mission now. Because at the cross, Jesus won your pardon. So that you can be in God's presence around the throne forever. And that message, this message, this one message that gives us life, is for all people. This message is for that family who lives next door to you. This message is for the widow who lives across the street. This message is for the mum or dad who waits at the school gate to pick up their kids. This message is for your friends at school, for your doctor. This message is for your husband, for your wife, 
for your children, for your friends. This is a message of rescue and salvation for all people. And knowing how it ends makes all the difference. Knowing how it ends shapes how you live now. Knowing how it ends gives you purpose now. You know, the church itself, the church of God itself is an outpost of heaven. It is a colony of the kingdom and we live here as God's people, as his citizens. And so how we live, how we act, how we engage, how we love, how we suffer, that has purpose and meaning and a goal because we are residents of God's kingdom, washed in the blood of the Lamb. Part of that great multitude worshipping God. As followers of Jesus, that end goal, that end game must grip us now. Must captivate our hearts now, must stir our hearts now. Because this good news that Jesus saves, that we are part of God's forever kingdom, has such a radical reshaping, refocusing, repurposing of our lives now as we go and take that good news to others. Knowing who Jesus is and knowing what he's done, that he is the Lamb of God who has rescued us, gives us hope, gives us strength, gives us purpose as we journey now. Knowing how the story ends is so important as we live now as God's people. Because this glimpse from the future, that empowers us in our mission now. And please join me as I pray. Our great God and King. Father, you are the one who is to receive all blessing and glory and wisdom and thanksgiving and honour and power and might to your name forever and ever. We thank you for the Lord Jesus, the Lamb of God who was slain for us, who shed his blood for us to rescue us so that we could have life and be brought into your forever kingdom. Father, we pray that we would live with a heavenly perspective, that knowing that we are part of that great multitude gathered around your throne, Lord, that that would give us strength and courage and perseverance as we live for you now. That this would empower us in our mission as we go and tell people that Jesus is Lord and that Jesus saves. Father, please enable us to do this. Give us strength to do this, we pray. And we ask this in his name. Amen. Please join with me in prayer as we bring our concerns before God. Let's pray. Lord God, we come to you because we know that you are the God who cares, you understand, you are the God who knows what we are like. Indeed, your Son, our Lord Jesus, lived on earth as a human being. He understood the trials and tribulations of this world. We thank you that uh, even through the trials that he encountered, He brought about new life for us. We have the assurance that in him we have a great hope that will never disappoint. Father, we pray renew us in our hope and our trust in the Lord Jesus through this time. We bring before you the counselling service for the Presbyterian Church in New South Wales. We thank you for the work that they do in helping people to persevere through the tough times in life. We thank you for those counsellors they have that work with them. We pray for a good ongoing relationship there as they work with people in need to help them through the struggles of life. Father, we thank you that uh, you have provided uh, Justine to oversee this ministry. We pray that you will strengthen and encourage her, help her to listen well and to respond appropriately to people who call in with need. Father, we pray that uh, you'll be especially near to those who are struggling with mental health issues through this time of the COVID-19 disease. 
Lord God, we ask that you will help them to seek help where they are struggling. And we pray that uh, they might look to you, that they might find assistance from you. We pray that uh, those who are able to help them can administer your word and your truth to their hearts. Now, Father, we pray help each one of us as we have to deal with the restrictions and the concerns over the disease and uh, the other struggles that it has brought on life. Father, we pray, help us to rest in you and your goodness, your purpose for us. Our Father, we thank you for this time of school holidays. We pray that you'll be with uh, the children and their parents through this time, that they might enjoy some relaxing times together, some times refreshing and renewing before they head back to school. We pray for uh, the, the teachers. We pray that you'll give them a good break to be restored and renewed and uh, help them being prepared for uh, next term and what that will bring in terms of how they do schooling under the current circumstances. Father, we pray for those who are travelling. We pray watch over them and keep them safe. Father, we thank you that there are some opportunities opening up for travel while also there are others that are uh, closing at this time. We pray that you'll be with those who are impacted by the closing of the border with Victoria. And we pray that you'll help them to be patient and to uh, wait until things are eased off again. Father, we pray that uh, you'll be with those in Victoria who are seeking to, uh, to contain and to deal with the outbreak of the coronavirus there in many parts of Melbourne. And Father, we pray that you'll give them wisdom to know what to do and how to do it. We pray that the people uh, there who are impacted by the uh, more closures and restrictions, that they will be patient and that they will see the need. And Father, we pray that uh, you will be at work through all these measures to uh, bring an end to the uh, impact of the virus there. Father, we thank you for uh, the way that uh, we have been able to manage things here in Australia, that... Uh, We've been not impacted anywhere near as badly as many other countries. We commit those places to you, Father, where they are struggling with thousands of people uh, who have died and who have been impacted uh, and their, their families. And, Father, we just, we are overwhelmed when we look at the, the numbers that uh, they are in so many different countries. Father, we know that uh, it is not outside your control, that you are the God who is able to work even through this uh, terrible times to bring about your good purpose. Father, we pray that you will continue your work in there and be with those who are seeking to serve and to minister to those in need. We pray that you might, through this time, uh, bring restoration and health, but particularly that people might be caused to look to you to find in you their true source of hope. So, Father, we commit ourselves to you. You know our needs. You know there's issues that we struggle with. We know that you are the God who is good and the God who cares for us. Please help us to rest in you and your goodness. And we pray, renew us in our faith and our walk with you. For we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen.
come to the end of our service for today I want to read to you a few words uh, that Jesus spoke he said come to me all you who are weary and burdened and I will give you rest take my yoke upon you and learn from me for I am gentle and humble in heart and you will find rest for your souls for my yoke is easy and my burden is light may we come to Jesus and find our true rest in him and to him be all the glory and power and honour forever and ever. Amen. Goodbye and we'll see you next time.